The Man in the Brown Suit Prologue Nadina The Russian dancer who had taken Paris by storm Swayed to The sound of the applause Bout and bout again Her narrow black Eyes narrowed themselves still more The long line of her scarlet Mouth curved faintly upwards Enthusiastic Frenchmen continued to Beat the ground appreciatively as the curtain fell with a swish. Hiding the reds and blues and magentas of the bizarre underscore decors. Underscore in. A swirl of blue and orange draperies the dancer left the stage. A. Bearded gentleman received her enthusiastically in his arms. It. Was the manager. Magnificent. Underscore petite. Underscore magnificent. He cried. Tonight you have surpassed yourself. He kissed her gallantly on both cheeks in a somewhat matter-of-fact manner. Madame Nadina accepted the tribute with the ease of long habit and passed on to her dressing room, where bouquets were heaped carelessly everywhere. Marvelous garments of futuristic design hung on pegs, and the air was hot and sweet with the scent of the Massed blossoms and with more sophisticated perfumes and essences. Jean. The dresser. Ministered to her mistress. Talking incessantly. And pouring out a stream of fulsome compliment. A knock at the door interrupted the flow. Jean went to answer. It. And returned with a card in her hand. Madam will receive. Let me see. The dancer stretched out a languid hand. But at the sight of the name on the card, Count Sergius Paolovich, a sudden flicker of interest came into her eyes. I will see him. The maze underscore peignoir. Underscore Jean. And quickly. And. When the count comes you may go. Underscore Biet. Madam. Underscore. Jean brought the underscore peignoir. Underscore an exquisite wisp of corn-colored. Chiffon and ermine. Nadina slipped into it. And sat smiling to. Herself. Whilst one long white hand beat a slow tattoo on the glass. Of the dressing table. The count was prompt to avail himself of the privilege accorded to. Him a man of medium height. Very slim. Very elegant. Very pale. Extraordinarily weary. In feature. Little to take hold of. A man. Difficult to recognize again if one left his mannerisms out of. Account. He bowed over the dancer's hand with exaggerated. Courtliness. Madam. This is a pleasure indeed. So much Jean heard before she went out closing the door behind. Her. Alone with her visitor. A subtle change came over Nadina's. Smile. Compatriots though we are. We will not speak Russian. I think. She observed. Since we neither of us know a word of the language. It might be. As well. Agreed her guest. By common consent. They dropped into English. And nobody. Now that. The Count's mannerisms had dropped from him. Could doubt that it was his native language. He had, indeed, started life as a quick-change music hall artiste in London. You had a great success tonight, he remarked. I congratulate you. All the same, said the woman. I am disturbed. My position is not what it was. The suspicions aroused during the war have never died down. I am continually watched and spied upon. But no charge of espionage was ever brought against you. Our chief lays his plans too carefully for that. Long life to the colonel. Said the count. Smiling. Amazing. News. Is it not? That he means to retire? To retire. Just like a. Doctor. 
or a butcher, or a plumber, or any other businessman. Finish Nadina. It should not surprise us. That is what the colonel has always been an excellent man of business. He has organized crime as another man might organize a boot factory. Without committing himself, he has planned and directed a series of stupendous underscore coups. Underscore embracing every branch of what we might call his profession. Jewel robberies. Forgery. Espionage, the latter very profitable in wartime. Sabotage. Discreet assassination. There is hardly anything he has not touched. Wisest of all. He knows when to stop. The game begins to be dangerous. He retires gracefully with an enormous fortune. Hum. Said the Count doubtfully. It is rather upsetting for all of us. We are at a loose end. As it were. But we are being paid off on a most generous scale. Something. Some undercurrent of mockery in her tone. Made the man look at her. Sharply. She was smiling to herself. And the quality of her smile. Aroused his curiosity. But he proceeded diplomatically. Yes. The colonel has always been a generous paymaster. I. Attribute much of his success to that and to his invariable plan. Of providing a suitable scapegoat. A great brain. Undoubtedly a. Great brain. And an apostle of the maxim. If you want a thing done. Safely. Do not do it yourself. Here are we. Every one of us. Incriminated up to the hilt and absolutely in his power. And not. One of us has anything on him. He paused. Almost as though he were expecting her to disagree with. Him. But she remained silent. Smiling to herself as before. Not one of us. He mused. Still. You know. He is superstitious. The old man. Years ago. I believe. He went to one of these. Fortune-telling people. She prophesied a lifetime of success. But. Declared that his downfall would be brought about through a woman. He had interested her now. She looked up eagerly. That is strange. Very strange. Through a woman. You say? He smiled and shrugged his shoulders. Doubtless. Now that he has retired. He will marry. Some young. Society beauty. Who will disperse his millions faster than he. Acquired them. Nadina shook her head. No. No. That is not the way of it. Listen. My friend. Tomorrow. I go to London. But your contract here? I shall be away only one night. And I go incognito. Like royalty. No one will ever know that I have left France. And why do you think? That I go? Hardly for pleasure at this time of year. January. A detestable. Foggy month. It must be for profit. Eh. Exactly. She rose and stood in front of him. Every graceful line. Of her arrogant with pride. You said just now that none of us had. Anything on the chief. You were wrong. I have. I. A woman. Have. Had the wit and. Yes. The courage for it needs courage to. Double cross him. You remember the De Beer diamonds? Yes. I remember. At Kimberley. Just before the war broke out. I. Had nothing to do with it. And I never heard the details. The case. Was hushed up for some reason. Was it not. A fine haul too. A hundred thousand pounds worth of stones. Two of us worked. It under the colonel's orders. Of course. And it was then that. 
I saw my chance. You see. The plan was to substitute some of the De Beer diamonds for some sample diamonds brought from South America by two young prospectors who happened to be in Kimberley at the time. Suspicion was then bound to fall on them. Very clever. Interpolated the Count approvingly. The Colonel is always clever. Well. I did my part but I also. Did one thing which the Colonel had not foreseen. I kept back. Some of the South American stones one or two are unique and could. Easily be proved never to have passed through De Beer's hands. With. These diamonds in my possession. I have the whip hand of my esteemed. Chief. Once the two young men are cleared. His part in the matter. Is bound to be suspected. I have said nothing all these years. I. Have been content to know that I had this weapon in reserve. But. Now matters are different. I want my price and it will be a big. I might almost say a staggering price. Extraordinary. Said the Count. And doubtless you carry these. Diamonds about with you everywhere? His eyes roam gently round the disordered room. Nadina laughed softly. You need suppose nothing of the sort. I am. Not a fool. The diamonds are in a safe place where no one will. Dream of looking for them. I never thought you a fool. My dear lady. But may I venture to. Suggest that you are somewhat foolhardy. The colonel is not the. Type of man to take kindly to being blackmailed. You know. I am not afraid of him. She laughed. There is only one man I. Have ever feared and he is dead. The man looked at her curiously. Let us hope that he will not come to life again. Then. He remarked. Lightly. What do you mean? Cried the dancer sharply. The Count looked slightly surprised. I only meant that a resurrection would be awkward for you. He. Explained. A foolish joke. She gave a sigh of relief. Oh. No. He is dead all right. Killed in the war. He was a man who. Once loved me. In South Africa? Asked the Count negligently. Yes. Since you ask it. In South Africa. That is your native country. Is it not? She nodded. Her visitor rose and reached for his hat. Well. He remarked. You know your own business best. But. If I. Were you. I should fear the colonel far more than any disillusioned. Lover. He is a man whom it is particularly easy to underestimate. She laughed scornfully. As if I did not know him after all these years. I wonder if you do. He said softly. I very much wonder if you. Do. Oh. I am not a fool. And I am not alone in this. The South African. Mail boat docks at Southampton tomorrow. And on board her is a. Man who has come specially from Africa at my request and who has. Carried out certain orders of mine. The colonel will have not. One of us to deal with. But two. Is that wise? It is necessary. You are sure of this man? A rather peculiar smile played over the dancer's face. I am quite sure of him. He is inefficient. But perfectly. Trustworthy. She paused. And then added in an indifferent tone of. Voice. As a matter of fact. He happens to be my husband. Chapter I. Everybody has been at me. Right and left. To write this story from. The great, represented by Lord Nasby, to the small, represented by. Our late maid of all work. Emily. Whom I saw when I was last in. England. Lore. Miss. What a beautiful book you might make out of. It all just like the pictures. 
I'll admit that I've certain qualifications for the task. I was mixed up in the affair from the very beginning. I was in the thick of it all through. And I was triumphantly in at the death. Very fortunately. Two. The gaps that I cannot supply from my own knowledge are amply covered by Sir Eustace Pedler's diary. Of which he has kindly begged me to make use. So here goes. And Bettingfeld starts to narrate her adventures. I'd always longed for adventures. You see. My life had such a dreadful sameness. My father, Professor Bettingfeld, was one of England's greatest living authorities on primitive man. He really was a genius everyone admits that. His mind dwelt in Paleolithic times. And the inconvenience of life for him was that his body inhabited the modern world. Papa did not care for modern man even. Neolithic man he despised as a mere herder of cattle. And he did not rise to enthusiasm until he reached the Mysterian period. Unfortunately one cannot entirely dispense with modern men. One is forced to have some kind of truck with butchers and bakers and milkmen and greengrocers.